Hello there, Salim Omar here from the Straight Talk by Small Business Success podcast. I have another amazing guest with us. His name is Glenn Bullis. Glenn, welcome. Thanks, Salim. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. The, Glenn is the co-founder, vice president, and general major, manager of Gap Wireless Inc., a leading product and service distributor for the mobile broadband and wireless markets. With over three decades of experience in sales, he has spent thousands of hours in the field or on the phone with customers and working with salespeople to help create several very successful companies. Glenn, I can't wait for this. Let's start off with you sharing a little bit about your backstory. Sure, no problem. Believe it or not, before I started in business, I, was, I worked for the federal government. I was a civil servant. I went to school for electronics. I got recruited by the federal government in the weather service environment, Canada. I'm in Canada and they sent me some for more training. And then they sent me up to the Arctic to work on a weather station. And I was fixing electronics and working on doing weather observations for them. And it was quite an interesting job at 21 years of age, you know, but the isolation was not much fun. I transferred to their head office in Toronto and my boss at the government said that I was in the wrong field, said I needed to go into sales, right? And wow. <laughs> so I, you know, I went into sales, I applied for a job, I got the job. There, there's some funny stories there if we have time. And I worked for a sales company for five years and I approached them about a business idea that I had to start a business go after this newfangled technology. The president of that company said, oh, you know, you can write your plan, show it to me, but I'm going to probably show you how it's not going to work. And so yeah. the next day I, I ended up resigning and took my plan with me. And that newfangled technology was the, uh, was the cell phone. And of course, we know the cell phone never went anywhere, right? And so I've been working in the wireless industry since then. We now call it mobile broadband and wireless. And I started a company, ran it for 15 years and sold it. And then I started another company and I ran it for another 15 years from 2007 until 2022. And I sold this business to a private equity firm in February. And I agreed to stay on with them for a few years, helping them grow the business. And then hopefully at that point, I'll, uh, you know, fade off into the sunset and uh, retire mm. or some such thing. Right. So that, that's the quickest, shortest yeah. version. Yeah. Happy yeah, to go amazing. into any detail you want. And um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What would you attribute if there was one skill, one thing Glenn, that you did in creating two multi-million dollar companies, what was that one skill? It always boils down to the same thing. And it's the separating factor from a series of successes and non-success. I don't want mm -hmm. to say failure because the difference is, is taking action in the face of fear, danger, uncertainty, or any other misgiving that you might have. And regardless of, of said misgivings, fears, or whatever, just driving through and making a decision and taking an action. When the, the owner of that first company said he wasn't interested in my plan, I literally quit my job. I'd only been married six days at the time. Went home oh. to the wife and said, oh, by the way, honey, I quit. <laughs> and and wow. uh, yeah, and then I sold the business 15 years later. There was a lot of problems that went with the, with the new owners which should cause me to leave and, and start a new business. And again, there was a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, and I had to take action. And throughout the 2007 to 2022, there were very, a lot of market conditions and changing forces in my industry. And again, a lot of uncertainty. And what helps you to continue on is to con just drive through and continue to try to show leadership and mm -hmm. make decisions in the face of danger and uncertainty. Yeah. And the way you say that, you know, uncertainty, that's just the way it is. When we run a business, there is a lot of that. There's ups and downs and various things that, that happen. Yeah. Despite that, you mentioned that that one skill is being decisive and taking action. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Got it, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't know it all, right? You need people to help you whenever. So it's not going to be knowing it all because you never will. Right. And there's always someone smarter than you. But the difference is a lot of people, I like to say, can be full of a lot of hot air. But, you know, the, the real people that make a difference are the ones that take action. 
you know, and mm-hmm. they put their money where their mouth is. They take a step forward when other people's are hesitating. And these little differences make all the difference. And as I explained to a salesman a while back, he was asking about how he got ahead when he was comparing himself to other people. And you know, he was saying like, oh, how am I going to get, you know, to be that much better? And I said, you really don't need to be that much better than him. You only need to be like one millimeter better, right? Like the difference mm-hmm. between the winner and second place in an Olympic race is like a hair, yeah. right? But the, that difference is the difference between the winner and second and third and fourth place, right? Um, yeah. And so you should always be striving to be better, be cognizant of those, what people are doing around you and not being like sitting on your laurels saying, oh, well, we're successful now, so we'll be successful tomorrow, right? You know, I, I, I love that saying, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not after me, right? And uh, yeah, yeah. so I'm constantly evaluating the business, the markets we're in, our approach, everything, pricing, terms, the whole nine yards, just to make sure that we're, we stay competitive and we're not sitting around thinking, you know, we figured it out a few years ago and that, that'll still work today, right? Mm-hmm. How important is it for a, for a small business owner to, to master sales? Well, it, nothing happens in a business until you sell something. And so oftentimes, a, a lot of people over the years or whatever, people come to me, oh, I'll get this great idea, this widget, this service, this software, this whatever. And I'm like, okay, well, who's going to buy it? Oh, no, but it's the greatest, fastest, deepest, cheapest, widest, best. I know. I'm sure it is. I'm sure you're capable of, you know, or, or I know where I can get this great product from a different country and it's, they don't sell it in the North America or in whatever market. And I'm like, great. Who's going to buy it? Where's your customers? Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, oh, no, I know I'll get customers. I said, start with the customers. Start with mm. the sale. Everything happens after you've made your first sale. Mm-hmm. Right? How so, important is marketing? You know, does marketing set the stage to make a sale? Well, so whenever someone says marketing, then I always immediately reply with a little speech, right? Which is don't confuse marketing with sales, right? And people are like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Right? And they always say, oh, sales and marketing. And, or they'll hire a guy and they'll say, hey, let's hire a director of sales and marketing. And I'm like, well, what do they know about sales or marketing? Oftentimes they know marketing, but not sales or they know sales or not marketing. Hmm. They're two distinctly different disciplines and the thought of having one person, it's, you know, I guess maybe at some point there might be a VP of sales and marketing, but it, without experts in marketing and experts in sales, it, you won't be successful, right? So the way, the best way for a small business owner to understand the difference is, is this little story I tell, which is when your salesperson is in front of your customer selling your product whether he's on the phone or whether it's done through some kind of a direct virtual manner or whether you're literally in his business, you know, knocking on his door, calling on him or whatever, when you're face-to-face doing that, that is selling. Everything else is marketing, Mm -hmm. right? So all this lead generation, going on LinkedIn, prospecting, Mm -hmm. all of that is marketing. And oftentimes I prefer to have our people separate. The marketing team develops the sales leads. The salespeople have to follow them up. And mm-hmm. one is accountable to the other. I don't have any leads. Mark, it's marketing's fault. I've generated all these leads. There's no business. It's salespeople's fault. And so that's the way I always think about marketing. They're both vital. If you don't have any sales leads, you know, or any inbound, then your salespeople have nothing to do. Right. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. What are some mistakes that you see salespeople make? with their in front of a prospect physically or virtually? So, yeah, I mean, I could probably write a book on that. And you did. (laughs) And you did. And what's the name of the book? The name of the book is Never Sit in the Lobby. And it's one of 57 techniques for building a business and growing a career and selling, right? It's filled with a lifetime of stories and... uh, You know, Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, things you do not want to repeat, right? As well as things that you do want to repeat. So I go over many, many things that a salesman should do when they're visiting customers and things that they shouldn't do, right? One common mistake that people make 
is, and I tried to give these funny little titles to each little chapter so that it would stick in your mind later. And you could, yeah. you could share the idea with people just by naming the title because it would, it would tell the whole story. And so one of them right. is called implied familiarity also breeds contempt. And so I don't know, you may have heard the saying that we have familiarity breeds contempt, right? Yes. So I made up a saying called implied familiarity also breeds contempt. And what I mean by that is I tell a story where going in a, a, a customer's office and sitting down and noticing that he had a photo behind him holding a fish with another man, right? And I'm like, oh, wow, you're bass fishing. That, that's amazing. Like, I'm, I love fishing. You know, maybe we could go fishing sometime. And the guy looks behind him and says, oh, my God. He goes, that's my ex-father-in-law. I'm actually divorced from that woman. And I actually hate fishing. And I had forgotten that photo was there. Right. And thank you for reminding me. It takes it and throws the photo in the garbage, right? Right. And I mean, right. it's me assuming that I know about this guy and that he's a fisherman, right? I should have worked into the conversation. Oh, what do you do on the weekends? I know. Yeah. I noticed there's a photo of fishing. Are you an avid fisherman? Mm -hmm. And he, and then he would say, "Well, no, mm -hmm. God, no, I'm not a fisherman." And throw the photo, you know. Right. And oftentimes, when you're the recipient, when you're the customer, yeah, yeah, there's many times where they do that, right? Yeah, and, uh, they say, "Oh, I it's see misfiring. Exactly. It's misfiring, isn't it?" Yeah, I see that you drive this. I see that you do that, and they make all these assumptions about you. You yeah. know, and and it's and annoying. It, it's annoying. It's annoying for the yeah for the receiver. Yeah, and I mean, they don't even need to get halfway through their little pitch, and you're already annoyed, and you have to listen to the second half, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's one mistake that I always try to tell people. You know, I always tell them, God gave you two ears and one mouth. Do the math, right? You should be listening twice as much as you're talking. And if you've talked for more than a sentence or two, you probably need to shut up and, uh, mm. and ask another question, right? You know, because you're, you're there trying to engage the customer and get the customer talking, right? A lot of salespeople, they think they, that they're a circus performer where they need to be going in and doing a song and dance, right? And uh, oh, this is the greatest product and it's, it, you know, and it's big and it's fast and it's wide and it's cheap and it's 20% deeper than the competitor. And I have a giveaway on my website called the Punch Perfect Pitch and Close. And basically it's a technique that I developed to explain to people how to do the perfect presentation, right? Where you, you punch them with something that will alter their state, right? You don't literally punch them, of course. And so it's the very first part of your presentation. So you might start it, turn the lights down, and then start a video that brings out emotion in the customer that gets them engaged, right? And, you know, the sounds, the vision, the, the music, you know, hmm. you think of a car on a winding road in the mountains of California, not that I sell cars, but, you know, just to, in your mind, kind of come up with a thing. It could be a, a robot that works in production and speeds up the process by, you know, 400%, or it could be any kind of machine or software or whatever, just some kind of video, or maybe you just make a sound or you, maybe you just play a testimonial, you know, since we engage with the Glenn and Sons, our productivity has been enhanced by 20% and something to change their state and get them engaged. That's the punch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, then there's the perfect pitch. Which is I, which I use the Goldilocks principle, which is, you know, they have, you know, mild, medium, hot, good, better, best. So I always limit it to three points. Tell them what I'm going to tell them. Three things I focus on during the presentation. Go over those three things. And at the end, I review those three things. That's the perfect pitch. And then I move to the close. And when people say, how do you close a customer? I always explain that when you've done a profit punch and perfect pitch, you aren't the one closing. It's the customer. The customer saying like, mm. how do I get this? How do I get a trial? What's the price? What, how do we move to the next step? When they're asking you those questions, that's the mm. best thing. If you're having to pressure and move a customer to closing, you probably didn't engage them enough, right? You know, and most of the time, if you're talking to them about a product or service or whatever, they're probably going to buy that from someone. So if they're not clamoring to buy yours, they're probably interested in someone else. And you need to figure out what, what's missing on your end. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, too often when I'm having conversations with a business owner and they have a sales issue, you know, when we have this conversation about what their sales process is, it's getting too quickly to the sale, to trying to close yeah. them without yeah. doing the precursory work, the questions, the engagement exactly. before they get to that. They're too anxious to talk about their product or their exactly. service and how it's going to solve their problems. Yeah, that's usually from a lack of preparation and maturity. And, you know, you need to understand that you have value. You have every right to be inquiring about the customer's needs and why they're there, taking up your time. It's not just all, all about the customer. Obviously, you're focused on the customer, but, you know, your job is to try to get out of them what it is they need and why they need it. And then start marrying your product to those specific requirements, right? I mean... It's like trying to sell a four-wheel drive vehicle to a customer that drives on flat roads and the, and the weather never changes, right? I mean, that's probably not the feature that's going to sell them. You know right. what I mean? It might that be, may not be yeah. the customer, right? So exactly. that's what the sales yeah. process is, is to see if there's the right fit. Yeah, exactly. What we're offering is, you know, right for, for the client, for the customer in front that's of us, right. the prospective customer. One of the questions that I often get when I'm, talking to business owners is they're the salesperson, right? They created the organization. They're really good at sales because they know the product, they know the service, they're passionate about the business. They want to grow it. So that energy and enthusiasm shows through and they're able to sell and grow their business up until a certain point. What is that point? When should they start then looking you know, start looking to hire, bring in a salesperson or develop a sales team? Well, that's actually a really good question. And I find most entrepreneurs really want to be involved in everything, right? And so my answer would be, I would always hire the next person the moment I can, like capably, gainfully employ them and keep them paid, right? The best person to hire first is a salesperson. And the reason why is because the salesman is free. And everyone's like, what do you mean a salesman is free? And I say, well, a crappy salesman will cost you a lot of money, right? Mm. Because you have to pay them and they don't do anything, right? But a mm. good salesperson pays for themselves and everyone else in the building. So the faster you hire a salesman that's capable and productive and generating, you know, the quota that's been assigned, they're actually throwing off revenue that pays for themselves. Ergo, they're free, doesn't cost you anything. It comes from the revenue of the products that they're selling for you. And mm. two, if they're really good, they're throwing off enough revenue that now you can hire a bookkeeper as well. You can then, you know, that now you don't have to worry about the accounting. Then you realize, hey, the website and the social media is taking up too much time. You can hire a marketing communications person. And again, then maybe another salesperson. And so my attitude is always to hire the people as fast as possible, but not not to build a false company that that doesn't warrant it, right? Like if you don't have any business at all, then clearly you're a one-man show and you need to go out and generate some revenue, establish that your product or your service is viable, minimum viable product, what have you, mm -hmm. you know. And then the moment you know that you've got something, you should try to hire people to be replicating that success. Because you can only be in so many places at one time, right? You're going to talk to the bank, get financing, make sure your legal things are up to date, your marketing's up to date. You have to motivate the staff. You have to build a structure. Nowadays, you need to follow, you know, environmental, social and governance issues, diversity and equality issues. You need people and staff to do that, right? Right. So I always say that everyone's like, well, how do you handle so many things as the general manager? You're juggling so many issues. And I said, well, when I'm doing my job perfectly, I don't actually have to do anything. Like my job is the conductor at the front of the orchestra. I'm not playing the violin. I'm not playing the piano. I'm not playing the trombone or the French horn or anything like that. I'm actually orchestrating, you know, the music or what have you. And really I'm not doing anything, but I'm leading everyone. I make the final mm. decisions and I direct the general direction of the business and the staff on what they should be doing next, right? A lot of people confuse mm. doing with leading. And that's mm. the biggest mistake that a small business person can make. Oh, I didn't do enough. I didn't do this and I didn't do that or whatever. But your real job as the boss is to make decisions and to be a leader. That's it. 
right? Yeah. And if people, if you lead them, they will follow. And all they really need you to do is help them to make a decision or to make the final decision for them. Because most people will avoid making these choices. They'll push it down the road. And, right. and that's really what separates the leader from everyone else. Yeah, yeah. This is great stuff, Glenn. Really appreciate all the insights you've shared with us. I'm looking at the clock and we are now at the tail end of, okay. of this episode. A couple of questions. What's the best way for folks to reach out to you and more importantly, get their hands on your new book? <laughs> tell, yeah. us, tell us about that. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I have a website. It's just my full name, glennpoulos.com, G-L-E-N-N-P-O-U-L-O-S.com. And that links to all my social media. I'm super active on LinkedIn and Twitter. You know, I post some lifestyle stuff on Instagram and Facebook. You can contact me on any one of those platforms and I will respond to you. And there's links to all of the bookstores and places you can buy books on my website. But for most people, that's just as simply as going to Amazon and typing never sit in the lobby and it will come right up. The nice thing about the book, you don't have to read it all in one sitting in order to make it make sense. You can pick it up at any point and flip to any chapter and you're going to learn a lesson that you can put to work that day in your business, put it down, pick it up a week later, learn something new, go back to a chapter. And when you, you say to your salesperson, like, why haven't you visited Jack over at Acme Solutions lately? And they're like, oh, I just don't know what to do, or I don't know what we can, you know. And then you'll immediately say to them, go refer to the chapter, show up with something in your hand and something in your mind. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, so the book's very, very handy for figuring out these little tricks in order yeah. to how to engage a customer, get back to a customer. What do you do when you're stuck? What do you say on the phone? How to leave a voicemail, how to send an email. There's a million, not a million, but there's tons of, of little tips and tricks in there that people use every day. And I love it when I hear my staff talking to each other and they're quoting the book. And yeah. I know it's made an impact when I hear things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, great. And I highly encourage folks to, to get your copy of the book. And the simple reason is because you've shared some great insights here. The book is 30 years of your experience in the field and yeah, creating exactly. two successful multi-million dollar organizations. Yeah. So yeah. getting three nuggets, five nuggets from this book uh, yeah. is all one needs. <laughs> yeah. This That's year, why. the company is probably going to break a hundred million. So it's grown from very small. In 2007, we were at 2 million, and this year we'll probably do 100 million. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Glenn, yeah. thank you so much. Thank I you. really, really appreciate you taking the time out yeah. and sharing all the wisdom you did. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.